So like I said before, today we're going to look at three different gas laws. We're going to look at Dalton's law, Avogadro's law, and Graham's law. Now, Graham's law really is sort of off by itself. It doesn't relate to any of the other gas laws that we've talked about. The um, PV is equal to NRT, ideal gas law, or the combined gas law, which is Dalton Boyle and Gay Lussac. Okay. Um, however, Dalton and Avogadro, these new gas laws relate back to the old gas laws. So that's what makes these just a little more complex. So the basics of Dalton's law aren't so bad. <clears throat> the basics of Dalton's law is this. If I can get this to, there we go. <clears throat> So the basics, just shut that, of Dalton's Law, right? You look it up in a textbook or you look it up on a website somewhere, and it will say in a rigid container. And what we mean by rigid container is that that container has a fixed or it has the same volume throughout the experiment. No matter what changes are done to this, that container stays the same volume. Okay, so same volume, fixed volume, or constant volume. So very often you're gonna see this, a rigid container. And in that rigid container, we have a mixture of different gases, and it makes no difference what those different gases are. It could be helium, just random examples of substances in the gaseous state. Could be helium, could be hydrogen, could be carbon dioxide, could be water vapor, could be... Um, uh, carbon tetrachloride, something like that. Makes no difference what the gases are in that container, but the total pressure is going to be equal to the sum of each pressure of gas. So the sum, or the total, excuse me, the total is equal to the sum of its parts. That's literally what Dalton's Law says. So whatever your gases are in that container, each one exerts its own pressure. And in order to get the total, all you have to do is add them up. So in this case, if you had these three gases in the same container, you could just add together the pressure contributed by the helium and the pressure contributed by the hydrogen and the pressure contributed by the CO2 to get the total. And it doesn't matter if it's in atmospheres or KPAs or what we don't see very often is millimeters of mercury or tor. So in other words, the pressure of one does not affect the pressure of any other gas. They all exert their own pressure as if there were no other gas present. They all behave like they're their own individual gas. And that's pretty easy, right? Yeah. But nothing, as you know, in this capital H honors chemistry class could possibly be that easy just to add it up and get the total. So there is a second part to Dalton's law. And the number of moles of gas is 
proportional to its pressure. If again, they're in that same system or same fixed volume or volume is constant and your temperature is also constant. So pressure is proportional to moles or moles is proportional to pressure. What does that mean? What I mean by that is this, for example, if I have two moles of a gas, two moles of a gas, any gas, does not matter what that gas is. Is it a little teeny light gas like hydrogen or helium, or is it a big heavy gas like radon? It doesn't matter. The two moles are going to exert twice as much pressure as one mole of a gas. Two moles is twice as many moles. It's going to exert twice the pressure. If you had three times as many moles, it would exert three times the pressure, no matter what that gas is. Doesn't matter if it's a big heavy gas, doesn't matter if it's a teeny, teeny little light particle gas like hydrogen or helium. So the way that we use this idea of proportionality and Dalton's law would be a question like on the next slide. Okay, I just want to be sure that everybody has it. Everybody's got the concept. Okay, so the question might be something like this. So I have my fixed container, my rigid container, the volume remains constant, and I have three moles of carbon dioxide, two moles of oxygen, and they exist in that fixed container at a temperature of 298, and the pressure is 45 kPa. And what we want to know is the partial pressure exerted by the oxygen. Now this term partial pressure, I see sometimes gives students, um, it, it, it throws them off a little bit, but all it means is if the total pressures are equal to the sum or the addition of each pressure, then each gas is a part of the total pressure. So in other words, here we have a container. We have, oh, let me get a darker marker, put that one off to the side. Let's try this one. Better, three moles of CO2, two moles of O2. Again, we know that the temperature is 298 Kelvin and the pressure total because notice they did not specify that this pressure was for the carbon dioxide or that this pressure was for the oxygen. So we know that this pressure is the total pressure exerted by both of these gases. So in other words, part of this pressure is exerted by oxygen and part of this pressure is exerted by carbon dioxide. So when they ask you, what is the partial pressure of oxygen? They're literally just asking you, okay, so if oxygen contributes to this total pressure, what part of this 45 kPa is from the oxygen? Now there are several, several, several different ways that you can figure out the answer to this problem. 
mathematically. You can do all kinds of proportions and ratios, or you can set it up algebraically. So it really, when we're talking about Dalton's law, okay, we know that these two pressures add up to this one. But then the thing that throws the little monkey wrench in, right, is that these moles are also proportional to pressure. So in other words, this total pressure is three parts carbon dioxide and two parts oxygen. And knowing that logically, you can do all kinds of magical math to get to your answer. Let me show you how I would think about it just so you can follow what's in my head. And then again, whatever you method, whatever method you use to try to figure this out is totally fine with me. So Dalton's law says my total pressure is going to be equal to, in this case, the pressure exerted by the carbon dioxide and the pressure exerted by the oxygen. I know that my total pressure is 45 kPa. And because moles are proportional to pressure, I know that this pressure from the carbon dioxide has to be at least three parts of it, right? And the pressure of the oxygen has to be two parts of that pressure. Now, the reason why I can treat these both as X's is because it doesn't matter what the gases are. And I can add those pressures to get the same, okay? In other words, three times the pressure of this carbon dioxide and two times the pressure of this oxygen. Well, that means that I have, if I now treat this just like algebra, 45 kPa is equal to 5x. And when I divide by five, I'm going to get my KPAs, right, equal five into 45. I'm, oops, I'm going to get nine KPAs. Nine KPAs is equal to X. Now, really, what this X is, remember, is the moles proportional to pressure. So if you don't like the whole idea of X, you could think of this instead of three X, think of it as three moles of the carbon dioxide and two moles of the oxygen, which means all five moles exert the pressure of 45 kPa. Therefore, one mole exerts a pressure of 9 kPa. Again, it's just proportionality. So now if they wanted to know, right, the question was, what's the partial pressure exerted by the oxygen? Well, I know that I have two moles of oxygen. And if one mole is 9 kPa, then the partial pressure exerted by the oxygen, because it's two moles, is 18 kPa, right? Just proportion. However you want to lay it out on paper is fine with me. And if you want to check your work, because the partial pressures are supposed to add up to the total, and I know that one mole is 9 kPa, that means that the pressure exerted by the carbon dioxide is going to be 27 kPa because there's three moles. Well, if I add these two together, which is what Dalton's law says, the pressure of the oxygen and the pressure of the carbon dioxide, if I add these two together, do I get the total pressure, which they said 
was 45 kPa. Well, 27 and 18, yes! So that was the answer that they were looking for. And again, you don't have to lay it out this way. The way that you've been taught to think about proportions, however you do that is totally fine with me. I'm just trying to show you how it relates to Dalton's law and how the proportionality works to equal the total pressure. So you'll notice that a lot of that problem had a lot of logic, mathematical logic that went along with it, not as much putting it into a formula to find the answer. That is Dalton's law. Let's take a look at Avogadro's law. And Avogadro, maybe you remember way back when we first started talking about moles, that Avogadro's number was 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. In other words, what we were doing is using Avogadro's number to count the number of atoms or molecules or things, anything in one mole. If I got a mole of water bottles, it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd water bottles. Okay. So Avogadro's law is all about counting particles. So let me get this back up. There we go. And let's take a look at Avogadro's law. So this is what the textbook definition, website definition says for Avogadro's law. If you have equal volumes of gases under, and this is the crucial part, under the same conditions of temperature and pressure, notice it says same, not necessarily standard, but the same conditions of temperature and pressure, then equal volumes will contain the same number of molecules. Again, it does not matter what those gases actually are. So one could be a big heavy gas, one could be a little light gas, but if they have equal volumes under the same temperature and pressure, they're gonna have the same number of molecules. Now, if they have equal volumes, if equal volumes means that they have the same number of molecules. So for example, I have, let's just say I have one liter of carbon dioxide. And here I have one liter of helium. And let's say the carbon dioxide is at 298 Kelvin. The helium is also at 298 Kelvin. The pressure is 101.3 kPa, just because I really like to say that. It reminds me of a radio station, 101.3 kPa. So if they're at the same temperature and pressure, if they have equal volumes, that means that they contain the same number of molecules. But for Avogadro's law, they're going to ask us, okay, which one has a greater number of particles or which one has a fewer or lesser number of particles? Well, if equal volumes have the same, then it should follow the law that if we have different volumes, we can tell from those volumes 
which one has more and which one has less. Again, if they're at the same temperature and pressure. So let's say that this is, oh, I don't know, pick another gas besides carbon dioxide, helium. Um, ooh, let's say that this one is neon. And let's say, I was just trying to get a more colorful marker, but I suppose that color on color doesn't show up very well. So let's say that this is neon and this is five liters, but let's say that this is, I don't know, hydrogen at uh, 1.5 liters. And again, let's say that they're both at um, STP, they're both at STP, in other words, standard temperature and pressure. The temperatures and pressure are the same as each other, which means the bigger volume is going to have more molecules. And this one is going to have fewer. So in other words, you can count the particles based on the volume if they're at the same temperature and pressure. So that's where Avogadro's law comes in, right? We can count. However, we have to use the old gas laws to get the answer to this Avogadro's number because, or Avogadro's law, because let's say, all right, here's carbon dioxide one liter at this temperature and pressure, but neon is a five liter at this temperature and pressure, which one has more molecules? Well, if they're not at the same temperature and pressure, you can't compare them. So we have to convert them using the old gas laws to the same temperature and pressure then compare the volumes to answer Avogadro's law. <laughs> what did she just say? That is too much for me on a very rainy Friday morning. Well, we're going to work through a problem. Okay. We're going to work through one. We're going to work through. So here's a practice problem. I want to read it through and then I want to start to extract what they're giving us for information. And it says I have carbon dioxide and methane. CH4 is an organic molecule. Uh, they're in separate containers. We have carbon dioxide that occupies a volume of 3.5 liters, 298 Kelvin, 105 kPa. And the methane, CH4, occupies a volume of 3.2 liters. 273 Kelvin and 120 kPa, and we want to know, okay, which container contains more molecules? Well, according to Avogadro's law, if we're looking for more molecules, we want the bigger volume. But you can't compare the volumes until they're at the same temperature and pressure. So I want to read this again and pull out the information that they're giving us. And so here I have a sample. I'm just going to say, okay, I have a box of CO2 and I have a box of this CH4 methane. FYI, I said that's an organic molecule. Organic chemistry. <laughs> which I do teach a little semester of, um, and it's a fun elective. But organic molecules go by an entirely different naming system than what we learn here. So that's why I'm not calling this carbon tetrahydride. It has a whole kind of separate name. Anyway, so I have carbon dioxide and methane in separate containers. Carbon dioxide, it says, has a volume of 3.5 liters, the temperature is 298 Kelvin, and the pressure is 105 kPa. 
The methane, the CH4, has a volume of 3.2 liters at a temperature of 273 Kelvin and a pressure of 120 kPa. And we want to know which container contains more molecules. So I'm just going to put that little question of more right there up at the top so I remember what I'm looking for. So I'm going to blank this out because I have all my information pulled out here. And again, Avogadro's law says more molecules will occupy a larger volume if what you're comparing is at the same temperature and pressure. Well, we're not at the same temperature and pressure for this carbon dioxide and the methane, so we can't compare volumes yet. So like I said in the very beginning, we're going to have to use old gas laws to answer the questions of the new gas laws. Because before I can compare volumes, I have to change the temperature and pressure to be the same. So just because I have more space over here, I'm going to set up, I'm going to change the temperature and pressure to be the same as CO2. In other words, mathematically, I'm going to take methane and I am now going to do a T2, which is the same as carbon dioxide, 298 Kelvin. I'm going to take the pressure of methane and I want to mathematically change that to the same pressure as the carbon dioxide. So I want to make that 105 kPa. Yes, thank you, Joe. Because remember, Avogadro's law says all we have to do is compare volumes if they're at the same temperature and pressure. So I'm going to change methane conditions to the carbon dioxide conditions. But you know from before that if you change the temperature of a gas and if you change the pressure of a gas, that gives you a new volume of the CH4. That volume is no longer going to be this 3.2 liters. And now since we'll have them at the same temperature and pressure, now we will be able to compare the new volume of the CH4 to the old volume of the CO2 in order to answer this question. So like I said, we're using the old gas laws to answer the questions of the new gas laws. So now look at the information I have, right? We're leaving carbon dioxide alone because we're going to change the conditions of methane to be the same as carbon dioxide. And now we want to solve for that new volume. So I've got set up here, right? This beautiful P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. So I'm going to write my formula. And I'm going to put my first pressure in as 120 kPa, put the first volume. So the original volume of that methane was 3.2 liters when it was at a temperature of 273 Kelvin. But now I'm going to change that pressure to 105 kPa. I want to know what that new volume is if I change the temperature to 298 
Kelvin. So again, it's a proportion. It's a big proportion, but I suggest that you just cross multiply and find your volume. So I get 120 kPa times 3.2 liters times 298 Kelvin equals divided by 273 Kelvin times 105 kPa, close the parentheses, and my volume, right? Spoiler alert, you're going to get a decimal that goes all the way across your screen. So my new volume, this V2, is going to be 3.9920, whatever, 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 liters is the new volume of that methane when it's at the same temperature and pressure as the carbon dioxide. So now I can go back to Avogadro's law and since they're at the same temperature and pressure, now I can compare the new volume of the methane, which is almost four liters, to the volume of the CO2, which is 3.5 liters. Remember, that changed because we altered the temperature and pressure. And the question is, which container contains more molecules? More molecules is going to be your bigger volume at the same temperature and pressure. Therefore, your answer is the CH4. So an awful lot there. And yes, there's more than one way to figure it out. Okay. So questions, 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 questions. These are the two heavy ones today, right? The Dalton's Law and the Avogadro's Law. This last one is super easy and fun because you don't even need a gas law. All you need for Graham's law is the periodic table. So before I erase this, just want to see if you have any, any questions or clarification or why did you do this? So like I said, this last one, Graham's Law, is super straightforward. We don't even need a mathematical formula. All we need to know is what the concept is and our periodic table. So Graham's Law states this. And again, very textbooky, very uh, website-ish. And some of you read this and got this beautifully in the research that you did last week, which basically says, basically, it says, molecules of higher molecular mass undergo diffusion and effusion, right? So let's just take these two words and call them movement, okay? Diffusion is from an area of high concentration to low concentration, F fusion specifically is through a membrane, but we're just talking about the movement of gas particles. And this says that high molecular mass moves more slowly compared to lower molecular mass. In other words, right, high molecular mass means heavy heavy molecules move slower and lighter molecules move faster. 
Now, the only caveat here is if they're at the same temperature. In other words, in this room right now, in this room, we have this beautiful air that's surrounding us. And air is made of oxygen, carbon dioxide, a lot of nitrogen that we just breathe in, breathe out, right? We don't use it as the gaseous form. So nitrogen, N2, is going to be a lighter molecule than O2 and is definitely a lighter molecule than the CO2. So in this room, even though you can't see them, your nitrogen molecules are moving the fastest, oxygen a little bit slower, and carbon dioxide the slowest of them all, just based on mass. Just based on mass. If you mess around with the temperature, that's a whole other thing because generally speaking at higher temperatures, your molecules are gonna move faster. So then you're introducing a whole nother uh, variable and you don't wanna mess around with two variables at the same time, right? So questions like this, which are gonna be on that practice sheet momentarily. Suppose you have two balloons. Oh, look, balloons. And one's filled with helium and the other one is filled with carbon dioxide, it wants to know which is going to deflate faster. So your definition of effusion was diffusion through a membrane, right? When you have a balloon, it gets shrivelly over time because that gas leaks out but which one is gonna deflate faster or which one moves faster has to be the lighter molecule, period, end of story. So you look up at your periodic table of elements and we see that helium has a mass of four grams per mole, right? It's molar mass, but carbon dioxide is going to have a molar mass of 44 grams per mole, just because I've added it up only a thousand bazillion jillion times. And the gas that's going to move faster is always your lighter one. In other words, a carbon dioxide balloon is going to last longer than a helium balloon, assuming, right, only one variable at a time, that both balloons are made out of the same thing. Now, some of you in your research did see that we could actually calculate the diffusion and effusion of these gases with root mean squared velocities, etc. Yes, we could, but this is where... Sorry, they're practicing um, Wednesday bells, the new Wednesday uh, schedule. So anyway... Um, I totally forgot what I was saying. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Cause I probably already said it a hundred thousand times. Okay. So those are our three gas laws today. What I want us to work on in the time that we have left, please. The end.